So, uh, you know the kind of like magic wand filter in Photoshop? So we, we mentioned this problem just as a, an example, like very briefly last time, but today we'll actually solve it. Uh, so you know the magic wand filter in Photoshop where you know you basically click on a pixel and it kind of spreads to all surrounding pixels that have a similar value, right? So kind of select a uh, region of a photo that is of a similar color. So maybe, you know, maybe your background is mostly black but not exactly black, so you click on the background you know, it highlights the part of the image that's mostly black, and then you maybe do something like flood fill it to be completely black or something, right? Uh, you know, there's features like that in Photoshop, right? So uh, today we'll talk about like, well, how does Photoshop know which pixels to select, right? And this may not be like the actual Photoshop algorithm, but it's based on this sort of principle. At least, like, I don't know exactly how Photoshop implements it, of course, but it's based on this sort of principle. Uh, so let, let's think about it. Uh, so it looks like this. So the image can be seen as a grid of pixels. To simplify the situation, uh, we're, let's not consider like color channels and stuff like that for now. It's not hard to extend it to like have red, green, blue in your image, but let's say for now that the image is grayscale, because certainly like the feature is expected to work even if your image is grayscale. So let's like grayscale just seems like a simpler case because there's only one intensity parameter, right? You don't have to worry about like you know red, green, and blue. Like, when is a red pixel similar to a blue pixel, and questions like that, right? Uh, but in grayscale, it's, you know, very easy. There's only one dimension for the pixels. Uh, like, there's only an intensity value, and that's it. So basically, zero is black, and usually an image is like 255 or whatever is gray. It's usually like a zero to 255 value. I mean, zero to 255 is white. Sorry, no, not gray. Uh, and values in between of gray, like so, like so, something like 127 would be right between black and white, and that would be kind of like a medium gray. And if you have a value like 50, that's kind of like a dark gray bordering black. And if you have something like 200, that's a very pale gray that's kind of whitish. You know, grayscale is just black and white images. So, well, I don't need such a big example. Yeah, so, so one way we can model the problem, right, is the, the image is some kind of rectangle, right, uh, where every pixel can be seen as a cell. So this is obviously a very small example. Most images will be like 1,000 pixels by 1,000 pixels, which is part of the reason why you should solve the problem with an efficient algorithm, right, and not just, not just the most naive algorithm. Uh, because most images actually, you know, an image can have a million pixels, right, it's, and that's even a pretty small image in that. Uh, okay, so every pixel has some intensity value, so like let's say, I don't know, let's say this pixel is 10, and this pixel is 15, and this pixel is, you know, 30. You know, so, so you can have like some uh, pixel intensity values here. Uh, maybe, maybe I should even make this example smaller, because I don't feel like populating all these fields. Yeah, for example, and then Yeah, like for example, let's say let's say the image looks like this. These are these are like the individual intensity values of each pixel. Uh, and let's say here there's uh... okay. So let, let, let's say your image looks like that. These are the grayscale values of your image. And uh, one of the questions we can ask is like when you, well, first question is let's say I click on a pixel, I want to find the connected region of space. So this is like a contiguous region of space, such that uh, this region is like, uh, you, you know, it's all connected and all the pixels have similar values. So the way we're going to define similar is we're basically going to uh, allow, each, well, you know, and there's different ways you, you can define this, like you might not think this is the best definition, but for example, one way we could define it is we could say that it's uh, two pixels are deemed to be kind of in the same, uh, the, the, ha having a similar color if they are a certain threshold apart. So for example, we'll define a threshold, let's call it T. So let's say we set uh, T equals 5 here. So what that's going to mean is we're going to say that two pixels have a similar value if they are at most a difference, an absolute difference of 5. So if they can be up to 5 higher or up to 5 lower. Right? But if they're like dissimilar, like 30 and 60, then we say they're not really 
uh, in the you know similar colors. And then what we want is let we click on a pixel. So let's say somebody clicks on this pixel. We want to find the region of space that has that is connected and has similar color values. So one way we can represent this is we can model the problem with a graph. So what we can do is we're going to have a node for each pixel. It, that, that makes sense, right? Because you know the most obvious graphs mod, uh, in, in graphs, uh, vertices model entities and edges model relationships between entities, right? So the most obvious kind of entity here is the pixel, and it's clear that you know pixels are going to be you know adjacent to other pixels if they have similar colors. The relationship we're modeling here is has a similar color. So. Uh, what we can do is we can make a graph that basically mirrors this structure. So here we'll create as many nodes as we have, you know, pixels. And we'll connect two vertices if they are, you know, next to each other. So we have to define what next to each other means. Let's say here we're saying that it can be adjacent in any of the eight directions. So, you know, it can be connected like this, but it can, you can also have two pixels that are connected because they're touching like this, diagonally. Uh, so two pixels, two, ver two edges will be connected if they have a similar value, uh, you know, within five, within a threshold of five, and also if they are like physically next to each other, which we'll, we will take to mean in, in the eight directions. So what are the edges here? Well, so let's see, so this one is connected, yes, this one is not, and this one is not. Okay, so we're done with this one. Then this one is connected here, and also connected here. Uh, this one is uh, connected here, but not to any of, well, also here. It's, uh, it's undirected, right? There's no directionality here, because uh, if this pixel is similar to this pixel, then this pixel is similar to this pixel. You can see clearly that similarity is a bidirectional attribute, therefore it's clear that we're going to model this as a undirected graph. Uh, and there's also no weights here because this problem is clearly about connectivity, right? Like, sure, we could assign a weight based on the pixels, but it's not clear what that would be doing, right? Because we're just asking, like, which pixels are connected to which other pixels, which pixels are in the same kind of component. Like, this pixel can be said to be in the same component as of this pixel. Uh, so there's no there's no real point to having, like, weights here. So we see that we're going to model this as an undirected, unweighted graph. So here are the edges that exist. Uh, these two nodes are, seem to not be connected to anything. They're not similar to any of their eight neighbors here, or any of its you know, five neighbors here. Uh, and then this one is also not connected to anything. Uh, you know, this one's not connected to anything, this one's not connected to anything, and these two are connected. So basically, um, now if I click on a pixel, uh, the behavior I want is I want to select everything in the same in the same like contiguous shape here. So, uh, for example, if I were to click on this pixel, I would we basically want to be able to say, oh, okay, well, this pixel is similar in value, this pixel is similar in value, so I'm going to include that in my magic mask. But then, kind of, uh, you know, transitively, that since this pixel is similar to this one, this one also gets included. And 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 so here, essentially, what I want to do is whenever I click on one of these pixels, I want to be able to pick out this entire shape. Uh, so what we're fundamentally looking for here, what would be kind of ideal to have here, is basically this, uh, our end goal would be to generate kind of like a side matrix here that uh, labels values according to their, um, you know, we'll, we'll say it's like a component number. So a component number would basically be, you know, kind of mirroring this structure. It would just say that, but like this is part of one shape right here. This is part of one shape. This, so this is like shape one. This is a different shape. This is shape two, three, four, five, six, seven. These are all disjoint, and these are part of the same piece. This is the. So this is part eight. These are these two are connected. So that's so that's basically the connected components problem. Given you know, given a graph, given a graph like this, 
uh, translated into a labeling where you associate each vertex with a number such that all the connected pieces have the such that two vertices in the same connected piece have the same number. So like, so like, you know, this vertex will have one associated with it, this one will have one, 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 and that will tell us that this one and this one are actually part of the same shape. So then when, for example, you click on this one, you just have to pick out the pixels that have uh, number that are labeled with uh, label one. And so this basically captures this concept of uh, connectivity. We've modeled, uh, you know, the pixels as the vertices, and we've modeled as the relationships between the pixels as whether or not they have a similar color and are next to each other. And then we, and then, and then we ask, like, what's in the same piece uh, to get this, like, magic mask effect. Uh, so any questions on kind of, like, the definition of the problem and so on before I go on to kind of show the solution? Okay, I guess it's pretty clear, right? Yeah. All right. Yes. So, so in the end, we hope to generate, you know, something like this. That, you know, uh, this is just, you know, associating the pixels with the component number. So we hope to, you know, we hope to get something like this. Uh, the exact values don't matter, like in the sense that, in the sense that it would have been okay if this was called one, and this was called two, and this was called three, as long as, you know, we preserve the fact that two things have the same number if they are in the same component and otherwise don't have the same number. The, 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 like, in other words, the labels are arbitrary. We could have labeled them A, B, C, D, we could have labeled them 1, 2, 3, 4, right? It doesn't really matter, and it also doesn't matter what order we label them. Although, of course, you know, you could say, like, okay, I want the top left pixel to always have number one, and, you know, you, it's, it's easy to define constraints like that and respect them in the algorithm as well. Uh, okay, so hopefully everybody understands, like, you know, why it makes sense to model this problem using graphs, uh, because essentially it's a problem about connectivity, and graphs are good at uh, solving in a generic way problems about connectivity, and, you know, this is the final output we want. Uh, so how do we get it? Well, so what you might recognize, right, is, like, what happens if you just generate this graph, and then you run a BFS uh, starting, say, at this node, right? So, you know, you, you just generate this graph and you run a DFS starting at this node. So this is the pixel you clicked on. So, so what will the DFS do, right? The DFS will continue until it finds no more edges it can go to, right? So that basically means that at the time that your DFS completes, just if you run like a standard DFS on this graph, if you first build this graph and then you, you know, you find this pixel and you start a DFS from this node, what will the DFS collect? It will collect essentially this these nodes, right? It'll calculate a distance from this source, these nodes. So like this node will have distance one, this node will have distance one, this one will have distance two, you know, three, three, four. Uh, so, if, but, but the distances here are useless, right? Because you only care about what's connected. The distances are, themselves are not like that meaningful here. Uh, so basically, you can just run DFS and then you can ignore the distances. Uh, remember that the output of DFS is you basically get an output that looks like uh, you, you know you have uh, in the end you got you got you yeah in the version of DFS we saw you got like a distance map right where you know if you have some vertex labeled A you know you might your distance map might say it's a distance two so it's like no it's like a node to distance mapping that kind of looks like this you know uh, this is just some node and some distance uh, so. You know, BFS just generates a mapping like that. So if you were to just run BFS and you were to ignore, right? If you were to just ignore the distance and just just get the list of keys that were visited, that would actually give you all of this piece. Um. So okay. So one, uh, you know, uh, one way of solving this problem, if you just want to like be able to click on a pixel and then see, you know, what is connected to it, is like sure, you could store this graph. And then you can, uh, you know, when you pick a pixel to explore, you can just run DFS starting at this node. And, you know, in the end, just ignore the distances and get the keys. And of course, you can imagine that, like, if you remember the implementation of the DFS algorithm, we had some bookkeeping there for the distances, right? You can imagine that if you know ahead of time you don't care about the distances, you can even simplify that algorithm a little bit, just forget about the part that notes down the distances. And, you know, it can just return back the visited set without having to return the distances. So, 
you know, this is not much of a variation at all on BFS. This is more just like say, me saying call BFS and ignore the distances. I just wanted to kind of show this first to kind of, uh, you know, build intuition. Uh, it, you know, it, ho hopefully if you understood BFS, it should be pretty clear that, you know, uh, since BFS visits all of the connected vertices, you just have to start with the node and then, you know, let the algorithm do its job and then you'll get all of these connected ones. Uh, okay. But uh, let's say we want to uh, go a step further and we want to get something like this, right? Uh, so so this, is, this is not just getting this piece, this is actually assigning a label to every pixel so we know which pixels are uh, in which component. So how do we do that? Like, if we only did this, if we started with this pixel, like, we'd be able to fill out all of these values, but we still don't know what to put here, right? Uh, well, you know, the core realization is that just you know, you just have to run VFS for every vertex that you didn't get. So uh, some approach might look like this. Like here might be kind of like uh, sort of an approximate pseudocode for how you would approach it. Uh, so what you want to do is you basically want to start with every pixel. Well, so, so you know, you, you'll visit each pixel in turn. So let, let's say first you visit this one. Maybe we'll have like some looping order, like first we'll get all of these, then we'll get all of these, and so on. Or, I mean, we'll visit, we'll visit every entry here, right? And what we'll do is, like, if I see that this pixel has not yet been covered by any DFS, I'll run the DFS from this pixel. And so here, you know, I will get basically this lock. I will kind of cover all of these pixels. And then all of these pixels will basically be, be done in the first DFS. And then I will basically continue to iterate. I will go to the next pixel, and now I'll see that this one is already labeled. This one is already labeled, so I'm not going to run the BFS again, because if I did, I would get the same result, and I would repeat a lot of work, right? And I don't want to do that. Then I will go to this pixel. And OK, this is covered again, right? And then I go to this pixel, and this one's not covered. So at this point, I would run a new BFS from this vertex. And I know that this is not going to repeat any of the work of these, right? Because if this were somehow connected to any of the ones I already visited, I would have already visited it in the previous BFS, right? Like, there's no way that this pixel is going to like come back and connect to this one because if it, because all the relationships are bidirectional, and if it did, then this would have already connected here, and this one would have already been visited. So uh, basically, uh, you know, I'll run the BFS for this one, and uh, here this just produces a single node. So okay, so I visit this node. This one isn't actually connected to any of these. Then I, you know, I run it for this one, and again, this one only produces the same node. Then I run it for this one, you know, same thing, same thing, same thing. And then when I run it for this one, this one also visits this one. And so I end up with like some situation like this, where now these are the pixels that have been visited. And then you know, this one again, I go to this one, it's visited, 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 not visited. So I do the BFS again, but it only uncovers this one pixel. And then this one's already visited, so I don't do it again. And in the end, you know, I'm able to print out a matrix like this, uh, you know, just 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 briefly, because this is kind of an important type of problem. Like these connected components problems come up all the time. Uh, you know, let's briefly kind of see, uh, you know, short pseudocode for this sort of thing. Uh, and then after that, I'll show you a more complicated connected components problem. It was actually a problem I was asked in an interview uh, at a pretty like top company. Uh, and it's again, it's just a connected components problem, but maybe it's a little bit trickier to see. Uh, how it is. Uh, okay. So, uh, you know, so, so, so here, uh, and this is also a good example to see, you know, uh, different ways in which graphs can be represented, because remember that uh, in the last session, we basically said that, that, you know, the adjacency list, which is the primary format we use to prepare graphs for DFS, right? Uh, the adjacency list usually, you know, has some format like this, where you have a vertex mapping to a list of vertices it's connected to, right? So normally, you know, it has some format like this, right? Uh, so what kind of, what, what do you think, like, what identifier should we give to the vertices here? So, like, what's kind of the obvious choice for how we identify a vertex? What do you think? X comma Y, right? Like its x position and its y position should be the label of the vertex, right? That uniquely identifies, like uh, x and y coordinate uniquely identifies a vertex. 
So we don't have to go crazy like labeling it in a fancy way. Let's let's just use like an x y couple as our key to this map, right? Um, now what we can do is we can do one better. We, uh, we can say that like let's not store this in a generic map because our keys have a very particular structure, right? If you think about what our keys are going to be, this one has key zero zero, this one has key one zero, this one has key two zero, right? So these are laid out in a matrix. So let's just let let's just uh, instead of having a generic map, as you know would be the case for like a like the most general kind of graph problem, let's you know store it and let's store the adjacency list as a matrix itself, you know, mirroring the structure. So in other words, we are now going to have like let's call it A, and basically A of 0, 0, you know, like when we index into this 2D array, we're going to get a list here. And this list is going to be the list, like this is 0, 0, so it's going to be the list of things we're connected to here. So, for example, the list for 0, 0 will just contain this one pixel that it's connected to. So 0, 0 will just have the tuple 1, 0. I'm using this, uh, you know, parentheses notation to denote like a pair. Uh, alternatively, you might you know, like if you don't like the idea of like making a little struct and storing pairs. You uh, hopefully you see how it's not it's not hard to map like x y positions to a single coordinate, right? You could always do some kind of calculation, like you could basically say x y. Uh, I can represent x y as a single number by doing a calculation such as x times. You know, I'd have to take or probably better to do like. Uh, I'll take y and I'll multiply it by, you know, x uh, by uh, size of x, right? This like x dimension plus x, or you know, I can have some formula like this. So basically, if you think about it, zero zero evaluates the zero here, but then one zero evaluates the one, so this is zero one two three four, and so on, and then this one evaluates two. You know, however many you have here. So this one would evaluate five, six, seven, eight, and so on. So this is just you know a pretty obvious like mapping of this two D coordinate to one D coordinate, and then of course you could have a function that you know decodes this kind of representation back into the X Y when you need to work with the X Y for purposes of accessing it in the matrix. And then of course you know you don't even need a two D array. You could convert all the coordinates to one D, and you could use like array of you know some value here. So you could represent this as a one D array as well. You have the option, like you could, you could just make this a one D array. So like A of zero would have to like one here or whatever, right? Uh, so, so it's it's up to you how you want to model this. But just like uh, I'm just saying, like you know, this is a good example of like how you don't always have to use a map. Last time we talked about using, uh, you know, using just a generic map because that works with any kind of label you might have for the vertex, whether it's a string or. Uh, and into like a like some kind of like you know GUID or ID or whatever else, right? But this is but, but this is like you know because in this problem we know our coordinates of our of a certain kind. Uh, it's worth noting that you know we can just convert it to some format like this. And so you know I'm not going to write out all of the you know entries, but like for example the entry for a of two and one here that would be it. Uh, sorry one and. Uh, uh, no, yeah, two and one. I'm doing the x first, so so two and one would be this one. So here it has, you know, the entry for here it is uh, adjacency is one zero two zero, uh, and uh, this one two and this one two. So that's you know two two and uh, one three or whatever. Okay. So you know, this is just an example of how this adjacency map looks like. So we, we when we pre-process this, like first we will do kind of a trivial pre-processing step. Uh, hopefully, I don't need to explain how to do this because it's like pretty straightforward, right? You just visit, uh, like you allocate an array of the same dimensions as this, but it's an array where each cell is going to hold a list. And uh, basically, what you do is you visit each pixel, and for each pixel, you check which neighboring, which of the eight directions have are within the thre threshold, right? We're going to check which neighboring pixels are within the, within the threshold, and we're going to put them in the list if they're within the threshold. So basically, for every possible x y, not just for these two, of course, these are just examples, but for every x y, we're going to build this kind of representation, uh, where where like you know we're, we're going to have this matrix A, which you know is 
you know, key on two integer values, and then and then each cell in the matrix is a list of these adjacency pairs. You know, of these coordinate pairs that are the, that the pixel is said to be connected to. So after we build this representation, we can just modify the BFS algorithm to run directly on this representation, so it doesn't have to do math lookups or whatever else. Uh, okay. So then let's uh, let, let you know. Let's see, kind of like an approximate pseudocode for getting uh, you know getting this kind of representation. So you know the the idea is pretty straightforward. Just kind of visit each pixel, and for each pixel, if we don't know what component that pixel belongs to yet. Then, then do a BFS from that pixel. Otherwise, just skip the pixel, right? We want to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if we, if for example, we run the BFS against this piece and all of these values right here, then when we start out over here, we don't want to visit these values again. So, you know, how would this look like? Well, okay, so let's say we have you know, so we have some function definition. What uh, I, I, I use kind of like a somewhat Python sort of syntax for my pseudocode, but it's not meant to be exact Python. Uh, just so you're clear. Uh, okay. So what is what is going to be in this uh, in in this function? Well, you know, you need to you need to pass it some information about the pixel grid. So you know, you pass it some uh, well, you know, let's call it connected connected components. And you know we pass it the pixel grid, we pass it like the original pixel values, and well, and and, and that's it really. It just takes this one parameter. Uh, and okay, so the first step is we do this trivial step that I'm not going to show. I'm just going to show it as a helper function that builds this representation, right? Because this representation is pretty trivial. Just travel through all the pixels and build this graph. So I'm going to you know say like you know graph or you know, let's call it adjacency list to say that it's an adjacency list. So we're going to do adjacency list equals, um, yeah, adjacency list equals uh, whatever make you know. So you pass the grid to it. Oh, and I guess we also need the threshold t. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, I forgot about that. For this problem, I guess we need the threshold t. Unless, unless t is just a hard-coded constant. Uh, okay, so, so, so we just call this helper function. It's a pretty trivial, like, two loops traversal that populates, you know, a 2D matrix with, you know, entries like this. All right, and then what we want to do is, uh, well, okay, we'll have to keep track of what the next number to assign here is. So as we assign numbers, we need to know which number is next to be assigned. So uh, you know we'll call it we'll call this like next num equals one, uh, and we'll also need the result matrix, right? We need to allocate like a result matrix. So uh, we're going to have like result equals, uh, and you know in, in Python this, the syntax for this is a bit cryptic, so I'll use a more Java-like syntax here. Uh, so basically, you know, new int array, uh, you know, grid dot x dimension, grid dot y dimension. So we're basically just copying the dimensions of the grid. This isn't exact like Java code either, but like, yeah, hopefully it's, the intent here is very obvious. So, okay, so we're first going to build this adjacency list representation, then we're going to get this next number, uh, then we're just going to set it to 1 initially, that means the next component to be assigned is going to be 1, and then you have this result equals new int, uh, and these are its dimensions. And I'm going to assume that this means that initially every cell is initialized to zero. Uh, if that's not true, then okay, then add a line here where you call a helper function that initializes everything in this, in this to zero. Why do we need it initialized? It's because it's going to be important for us to know. Uh, it's important for us that the original state is all zeros because we're going to use the fact that something is a zero to know that we have not visited it yet. Okay, so, so then now that we have this set up, we'll do something like this. 4x in you know, 0 to x max. So, you know, iterate from, iterate x from 0 to the maximum of x. Uh, also, iterate y. You know, oh, I'll call this or whatever. You know, 
iterate y from 0 to x max, r to y max. And now what we'll do is we'll basically uh, check within here if, if the value is 0. So initially, you know, initially our grid, the, our result grid, starts out like something like this. Initially, it looks like all zeros. Uh, yeah, initially this result grid just has all zeros everywhere. And now we're iterating through all of its pixels, basically. And we're saying, okay, so we started here. Let's, let's do VFS from here and see what pixels we cover. And if, for example, we covered these pixels, then for now, these are the pixels that are going to be labeled. So uh, we need to check the condition here, which is just basically if result of x, y equals equals 0. You know, if it's, if it's still 0, like in other words, if we still don't know what component number it is, the component numbers will be numbered starting at 1. That's why. So, uh, you know, if we don't know what the component number is, then, uh, you know, start at 0, uh, th th then this condition will be true. Um, and then we basically run VFS. And VFS I'm not going to write the pseudocode for. We, we did that last time. So we'll just call VFS. And what are we going to get back from VFS? Well, we get a distance map back from VFS, right? But I'm just going to assume that here the VFS has been modified to not even bother recording the distances because it's not important. So instead, the VFS will return back a visited set. If you don't like that, then, you know, okay, just call a VFS that returns back the distances and get back only the keys. Right? That's also fine. So, so here, if, if this happened, you know, what you would do is you would basically say, like, your visited set is basically VFS, and I assume that VFS is going to accept the arguments x, y, and, and uh, this adjacency list. So, the, so x, y represents the starting node, and this adjacency list is the graph representation. VFS returns back the visited set. Uh, so this is just regular VFS. It returns back the visited set while operating on this adjacency list that it knows to be a matrix. Uh, and then here you get back here you get back this visited set, and now you just have to assign the values in this visited set to this, you know, to the, this matrix. And so. This is just like four, uh, you know, basically four entry, four, you know, four uh, node in visited. For every node in visited, we have to assign it to our matrix. So we do something like uh, result. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm assuming node is going to hold like an x and y. Result node dot x node dot y. Uh, and this would get assigned to this next number. That's where this is used. Next number. Okay. And and, and so basically here you ran a VFS and you ass you you assigned to every node of the result. So now, for example, every cell in here would be would be assigned to one 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 one. Like if these pixels were all adjacent to each other, these all now have assignment one. Okay. And so that means that now when I travel to this next one, I will do the VFS all over because I'll hit this condition, you know, as I iterate to the next uh, x or whatever. I'll, uh, when, I, when I get to x equals 1, y equals 0, I'll hit this condition and this won't be true and so I won't do any of this. Uh, and, you know, of course we have to increment the next number at some point. So we do this, uh, you know, we, we basically do this uh, after we've completed this loop. Like if we if we did go into this into this situation where we assign something to a new component, uh, then at that point we increment this number. We increment the next number by one. Uh, yeah, and, and then, then in the end, like this actually guarantees that it visits every cell, and every cell it has at least itself it has the as its DFS. So this actually guarantees that everything will get labeled in the result. And you can just uh, return the result here. So this is a pretty simple application of BFS. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully it's not that, it's not that hard to understand. Like it's pretty short code. Like once you write the BFS code, which is itself pretty short. You know, last time we saw the BFS code is only like five or ten lines, right? So. Uh, 
Yeah, like not too much. This is just a little extra work where around the BFS we, you know, we, we do the trick that for every unvisited pixel we basically start a new BFS. So we start a BFS here, we complete these, and then as we keep scanning, if we find another node that is labeled zero, we start a new BFS from there. So now let's look at time complexity. Like last time, I, I meant to get to this last time, but I kind of, uh, uh, you know, ran out of time last time. Uh, so I want to cover like what is the time complexity of BFS, and also what's the time complexity of this adaptation of it as well. So uh, let's look at it. So what does BFS do, right? Like it's essentially, what it's doing is you start at some source node. And here I'm just going to consider the version of DFS that calculates the distance to every possible destination node. You know, that calculates the distance from the source node to every other node in the graph. Uh, so you can, of course, if you're looking for the distance to a particular node, you can stop early when that happens. Uh, but, you know, in some cases it's very useful to get the distance to all the nodes. And we'll see a problem involving that shortly. So, uh, you know, let's just calculate this. Uh, time complexity for a pessimistic version where we actually want to get a distance to every node. Uh, you know, for some problems we need, and also we have to consider that in the worst case, right, in the worst case we won't find the destination node until the very last node. So in, in the worst case, uh, finding a path to the destination node is no, is no slower than finding a path to every node, right, because the destination node might be the very last node that our algorithm visits. So, okay, so here's the, you know, uh, well, what is the time complexity of BFS? So we start with sub node A, and, uh, you know, let's, let's consider, like, what BFS does here. So you might have some common nodes or whatever, you might have some nodes that are not common between B and C. So BFS will actually visit this node, uh, and, you know, as it's processing this node, it will visit all of its outbound edges, right? And that is basically the bulk of the work of BFS. As BFS processes the node, it has to visit all of its outbound edges. Uh, so the total time complexity uh, is essentially going to be, well, there's you know some additional bookkeeping that is not that expensive. Uh, but you know, the, the the main time that BFS spends is basically traversing all of its edges. When BFS processes a vertex, it has to it has to go through the list of all of its edges, and 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 so how expensive is that? Well, uh, you, so every vertex in BFS is processed exactly once, right? We have that system. BFS has that logic where before we ever add a vertex to the queue for processing, we check it if it's if it's not already visited, right? So uh, that means every vertex gets processed exactly once, and if every vertex gets processed exactly once. Uh, that means that, you know, the total time to traverse all of the edges is basically, uh, you know, sum, it, it's basically sum of, uh, you know, length of, you know, well, like let, you know, this be vertex 1. So vertex 1 has a certain amount of edges, and then, you know, vertex 2 has a certain amount of edges, and so it's basically the sum over all vertices, right? Uh, so, so how many total, uh, you know, how many, well, what is this total? Well, we know that every edge, every edge that is present in the original graph, uh, it's going to be connected to two vertices, right? So if E, if we let E be the number of edges in the graph, then this sum is actually two times E, because every edge appears in the adjacency list of exactly two vertices. So every edge makes a contribution of two to this sum. So in the end, we process something like two E edges, or just E edges in the case of a directed graph, because for a, for a directed graph, every edge appears exactly once in some adjacency list, uh, because it appears only when it's outbound. So we have two E, and then we basically have the time of like, you know, dequeuing stuff from the queue and so on, and that contributes a factor of order B. And so the final time complexity of BFS is order B plus E. And, uh, 
you know, uh, if, if I had like the pseudocode for VFS up here, I would just, you know, go through the lines and show that exactly all of the steps, you know, are covered by this time complexity. But, uh, you know, I encourage you to try that exercise on your own. Uh, you know, look at the pseudocode for VFS and uh, just verify that, you know, this is the time complexity. The, you know, the, the, main, the, the main time is spent in traversing all of the edges, that's this part. But you can easily see that, you know, all the other parts are just like DQ the next vertex from Q, which is order one with a good Q implementation. And so, you know, all the other time is covered by order V. And so you get this order V plus E time complexity, and V is the number of vertices, and E is the number of edges. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, this is actually a great time complexity, right? This is, the, this is great because the size of the input is V plus E. The size of like a graph representation, right? A graph is represented by like a map from vertices to, you know, to what it goes to, or, or even just a list of edges. But in any case, uh, the size of a graph representation is already this size. So BFS is just kind of linearly traveling through the representation of the input. So this is a great time complexity. Um, any, yeah, yeah, any uh, questions about this before I go on to the next one? Yep? I have a question on uh -huh. 2E, which is the number of edges. So it depends on how connected V is, right? Suppose if it's a mesh, a complete mesh, uh -huh. would it be still 2E? Like, um, well, E is the number of edges. Right. So, so, well, okay, so it's true that it could be a little bit less than 2E if uh, your VFS doesn't actually end up touching every vertex. Like, let's say you start, up, you start a VFS at vertex A, but there's some unconnected vertices out here, right? Then it's true that maybe, maybe doing just your VFS for A doesn't even have to touch all the vertices in the graph. But this is just an upper bound. If your, if your traversal touches every node in the graph, then the total number of edges traversed will be 2E. Why, why is it 2E? It's because every edge appears in two of the adjacency lists, right? Every edge appears as one entry in two different adjacency lists. Like, if you have this edge between A and B, it appears in A's adjacency list as an entry for B, and it appears in B's adjacency list as an entry for A, right? In the case of an undirected graph. So that's why the total number of edges traversed by the VFS algorithm will be, you know, every edge will be traversed exactly twice. Every edge will be traversed once for each of the vertices in which it appears. In the case of a directed graph, it will actually be more efficient, because in the case of a directed graph, an edge appears only once in one adjacency list. It appears what, what it, uh, so, so this edge will only appear, uh, if this edge is directed like this, this edge will only appear in A's adjacency list, and not in B's, because it's outbound from A. So then it'll just be E here. But you can see that the big O is the, about the same. Okay, so then what happens when you do a connected components algorithm? Is the, is the runtime still B plus E? And you could think maybe it's not, right? Because, because in the connected components, you might be doing this kind of BFS traversal for every pixel. So the obvious bound, right, like, okay, so, you know, BFS itself takes B plus E time. So clearly, if I have to do the BFS from every pixel, uh, you know, there, there could be an extra multiplier of B here. But that's why we did that trick where we do not re-explore any pixels that already have a component assigned to them. And so what ends up happening in the, in the connected components problem is let's say this is your grid of pixels, right? And let's say your first BFS covers, you know, some region like this. So what actually happened here? You spent B plus E time, where B plus E refers to the number of vertices and edges in just the component you visited. Because you don't have any edges to any component you, you know, anything that wasn't visited here is because you didn't have any edges connecting you to it, so you couldn't have spent any time there. So here, you only spent time proportional to how big this region is. So here you spent order V plus E, but V plus E only refers to however many vertices and edges were in this part. And then when you run another VFS, like, you know, let's say you discover like a second component here, you know, you start at this pixel and you discover like, you know, this other connected region, you'll again spend time V plus E, but only related to what vertices were in here. 
And then every time, every time you visit something that's already been, you know, paid for by this V plus E, uh, if you, for example, now try to go to this pixel, you'll see that it's already covered, so you won't run this V plus E algorithm again. So in the end, what happens is you can see that the total time complexity is basically some sum, you know, like let's call this like V1. This is the number of vertices in component one, and this is the number of component. Uh, this is the number of edges in component one. So the final time complexity ends up being a sum like this. But every component is disjoint. So that basically just means that, like, you know, blah, blah, blah. But uh, that, that basically means that V1 plus V2 plus V3, because these are all disjoint and disconnected components, that between them cover all of the vertices of the graph. This sum of however many v's here is just the total v in the graph. And this sum is the total number of e's in the graph, essentially. So, uh, so, so you know, you end, up with, you, you end up with basically order v plus e here. Because for every component, you only pay proportional to how big that component was, and you tra traverse each component only once. Oh, and then you have to add in the time of every time you actually go to a pixel and you end up not doing the VFS, right? You end up checking that condition and seeing the component number is not zero. But that is just plus V, right? Because that's just, you're visiting, at, in, at most V locations, you're going to just do a check, a constant time check, and that's going to get you to not proceed. Uh-huh. What you're adding is also, you're uh, getting out the region, right? Hmm? You have to figure out the region, right? Before we did this VFS, uh, like which ones are connected? Oh yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, that's true. So this is just the VFS component plus the, uh, you know, plus the extra overhead of the, uh, of getting the connected components. Yes. Uh, you're saying you also have to build the graph. We, we, we first have to get the regions, like the blue region and the red region, ready to build the graph. When the, we go through the grid that. Well, DFS is what gets those regions, right? BFS is what calculates those regions. Like, BFS is what's used to know that this is all part of the same region. Uh, the step I didn't calculate is the step of just building the graph up front. So, so, you know, so this algorithm, remember, it consisted of first build the graph, then, then, then you know, for every pixel, see if that pixel's already processed, and if not, run BFS from that vertex. Uh, now, what I'm saying is the total time for all of the BFSs you know, it ends up looking as a sum like this, but because, you know, because uh, V1 plus V2 plus V3 and so on is just V itself, uh, you know, because these are, these are distinct regions such that between them they cover all of the vertices, you end up with this total time complexity for running all of the VFSs. So in other words, it's entirely possible for one pixel to take a really long time, but then the other pixels must be really fast because they won't have much of a VFS left to do. It's essentially kind of like an amortized analysis, if you know what that is. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Uh, but, but essentially it's saying that if one thing takes a really long time, like it's possible that when you go to this pixel, it actually takes like the full time if you actually visit the entire matrix. Uh, but if that happens, then subsequent pixels don't take long at all because they've already been visited. So in total, you, you know, all the visiting times are set up like this, and you get the V plus E here. Now, the one thing I didn't count is, yes, you also have to build the graph. Like, if you're given the image, you have to translate the image into a graph, right? Uh, how long does that take? Well, you can easily verify that takes also only V plus E, right? Because uh, V plus E, B, B, because uh, every, every uh, pixel just has to look at its eight neighbors, right? Uh, so, you know, so every pixel basically, uh, well, in fact, here, in, in this particular image, uh, problem, we can see, like, let's translate this V plus E complexity back into terms that are in the original problem, right? Because the original problem makes no reference to V and E. The original problem has dimensions M and N, right? So here, to kind of, like, translate this back into those terms, uh, how many vertices does this graph have? have? Uh, it has order M plus N, or N times N, sorry. Uh, if you know if the image is m by n, there there's a vertex for every combination of x y position. So uh, there it's m times n, right? Which is basically just the, size, the number of pixels of the image. And how many edges does this graph have? 
Well, at most, like it may have fewer, right, depending on which pixels are actually connected. But at most, every pixel can be connected to its eight neighbors. So at most, it's at most this is eight m n, which basically means overall the algorithm is order n times n, which is great because m times n is just the size of the image. I mean, m times n is the number of pixels in the image. So this is just scales linearly with the number of pixels in the image. And then, you know, and, and now in these terms we can say, like, how long does it take to build the, build the graph before we start running this algorithm? Well, again, for each of m n different pixels, you visit eight neighbors. So it's basically constant time per pixel. And so uh, building the graph is also order m n. And so the total algorithm is completely, uh, completely linear in the number of pixels. Okay. Uh, so are people pretty, uh, pretty clear on this problem? Yep. Yeah, how is that related? Okay, uh, yeah, so the question was, uh, connecting components can also be solved by union find. So, uh, so for people who are just starting out in this graph series, you probably don't know what union find is, and that's fine for now. So union find is another, com is another uh, algorithm that has something to do with connected components, but it, uh, it's not really the best algorithm to apply in this kind of situation. Union find is more about what's called uh, dynamic connectivity, what dynamic connectivity is like, imagine a graph that starts out like every vertex is completely disconnected and has no edges. And then over time, you add edges to the graph. And as you add edges, you can imagine that things are going to start getting connected, right? Things that weren't connected before, regions that weren't connected before, are going to get connected if you add edges to the graph. And let's say that at any given time, you want to know whether two pixels are in the same component as you gradually add edges over time. That's like what union find does. So it, it's not really the best algorithm to apply to this situation. Uh, this, this situation is best solved by like, you know, like some connectivity algorithms such as BFS. As we'll see in some of the later sessions, there's also another algorithm called DFS, depth first search, which also, you know, can also solve this problem. Depth first search is also an algorithm just for visiting all of the nodes that are connected to you. Uh, unlike BFS, DFS cannot produce shortest paths. It can't produce. Uh, it can't tell you what the shortest path to a destination is. It just finds kind of arbitrary paths to destinations. Uh, but that's perfectly fine for this application, where we don't care about distances. So uh, later, when you learn DFS, you can always keep in mind that you know you do have a choice. You could, instead of using DFS, you could have also used DFS here for the connected component. Yeah, so it's actually, uh, this is actually, by the way, like, uh, once people learn about union find, it, they seem to apply it to too many things. And this is like a common, uh, like, failure mode I see. Well, it's not really a failure mode, like, because usually that algorithm is valid uh, for the ways in which people apply it, but often, like, BFS will actually have a better time complexity. And it's not necessary in these, you know, union find is not necessary for this sort of situation. Uh, okay. So now let's look at a more complicated connected components problem. And then we'll go back and we'll look at a complicated shortest paths problem as well. Uh, so I have lots of uh, good problems for, it, for you today. Lots of like exciting, kind of challenging, tricky problems. Always what I like. Okay. Uh, and by the way, for people who are like new in the session and you know don't know about the format, we will have like a break in the middle to, you know, uh, just because otherwise the session gets kind of long. Uh, so in a little while we'll have a break, but first we'll have time to do some problems. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, the first problem I'm going to do is this one, and I was asked this, uh, you know, I was asked this question myself in an interview. Uh, so the idea is you're given, uh, you know, your input is given as a Boolean matrix. So imagine every cell is going to have like an entry like, you know, true or false. I, I don't know if this is going to generate a good input. I'm just kind of putting the arbitrary letters here. Uh, okay, so so you know you have a, this Boolean matrix, and the idea is that a true value represents a forward slash, and a false value represents a backward slash in a grid. So effectively, this represents the following group. So first, you know, draw something of the same dimensions. 
and I'll put these little tick marks here to guide me in preparing this input. And so this true, it basically means that left, you have this. So like essentially this is the cell, but there's no wall here. This is just, this is the wall. The wall is this forward slash here. But this is just showing you like the position of the cell. Okay. So and, and then this false means there's a backward slash here. So again, the position of this cell, you know, this is this cell. And you know, we're gonna draw this backward slash like this. And after, and basically the question is going to be, after I draw all the slashes, how many distinct regions are there? It's like distinct walled off regions. So uh, this basically looks like that. So see, like these are going to be maybe all in the same region now, because it's formatted like this. So this false, uh, okay, so, you know, like that, and then this false looks like, like that. So do people see, do people understand how I'm generating this input? Like, do people understand, like, why it is like this? Uh, so you can see this is kind of giving rise to these sort of complicated situations where you can have this kind of, like, weaving back and forth in there, right? Uh, and these could, I, could, could, like, have, there could be, like, complicated shapes in here that are all part of the same region. So it turns out this is a pretty straightforward, like, connected components problem, but it's a little harder to see, I think, than, like, the normal connected textbook, like, connected components. And by the way, like, a big part of, like, interview prep or being prepared for these draft questions is, you know, having not just, like, an understanding of the textbook version of the concepts, but being good enough with the concepts that you can apply them to, like, these, like, more unfamiliar situations that don't look so standard. <coughs> It's really the case that, like, you don't need to know a lot of stuff to do well for the interview. In particular, about graphs, like I mentioned, there's about three graph topics that are important, which is, you know, shortest path connected components and uh, one we have yet to cover, which is topological sort. Those are, like, the three really important graph topics that, if you know, you're actually in a good position to answer, like, 95% of interview questions. But uh, you have to really know them well, and you have to be able to apply them to these kind of like challenging original situations that are not the most textbook applications of the concept. That's kind of the caveat. Okay, so let's generate this input. Okay, so this is how this input is looking so far. Uh, oh, okay, so, so this, for example, will, you know, this line will connect here because, you know, this was. Uh, this, right? Okay, so, 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 you know, here we have this, and here we, uh, we get this line. All right. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's, I, I guess it's easier if I just put the grid lines in there for, for now. Uh, it'll be easier for me to draw the input, and then, okay, so let me just complete this quickly. Uh, false, true, false, false. False, uh, true, true, and true. Okay. And now, you know, now I have to erase all these grid lines, and that leaves me with a certain number of distinct regions. And the question was basically, just can you find how many distinct regions this has? So, you know, after all the like intermediate grid lines have been erased, here is basically the shape. And as you can see, it's sort of a complex one. Uh, but how many regions are there? Well, okay, one. This is one region. This is region number two. This seems to be some big region number three, right? Okay, hopefully I haven't missed anything doing this manually. Four, uh, five, and six, and seven, and eight. That's what it looks like. Maybe I missed something, but that's what it looks like. So it looks like we have these eight regions. And the idea would be to, like, you know, you have to, of course, produce an algorithm, not just by eyeballing it, right? Uh, so, how do you solve this problem? What do you think our, uh, what do you think our entities should be? And here people get confused. Like, people will think, okay, you know, our entities obviously should be the, the positions, right? X, Y. Well, there's a problem with that. Why? So, so you know, can, can somebody think of like a good argument why it can't be that x, y it's by itself is the position? I mean, is the like type of entity we model. Why, why can't we say like x, y is the entity we model and we're going to model the relationships between different x, y pairs, between different coordinates basically in this original input grid? 
kids like, are uh, kids one by one. Uh, you have a line crew, and you just get two regions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so let's generalize your argument a little bit. So he, so, so he said, because like, if you can even imagine if you just have like a single input, right? So already here you have two different uh, two different regions, right? One and two. In just this trivial case, there's already two regions. Uh, but, but more to the point, right, is it's very clear from this example that it, it will very commonly happen that that the left and the right half of a particular pixel or the lower and the upper half, depending on how you choose to see it, uh, will not be in the same place, right? Like, like here, for example, you know, this pixel co corresponds to these two areas. This one is in region. This part is in region number three, and this part is in region number one. So, uh, ultimately, what we want to know is we want to know how many. Like, we want to be able to associate something with what region it's in, but a particular coordinate can be in multiple regions at the same time. It can be in two different ones, right? Its lower half and its upper half can be in different regions. Uh, so that that kind of disqualifies that from being, you know, the thing we model, right? We don't want the entity to be the coordinate because the coordinate does not uniquely correspond to a region. Uh, some people say, like, you know, let's, let's make, like, junction points the entities. Well, that's actually even worse, right? Because, 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 I mean, you know, it's easy to see that a point like this can be, you know, in regions six and seven. But in fact, it's even worse. You can, you can construct a situation where maybe, you know, maybe, you know, you get something. Well, yeah, maybe you get something like this, right? And there's actually like three different regions at that point. So, what do you think we should model? Any like ideas? Uh, what should be the like? What should be the vertex in our graph here? So first of all, this is pretty clearly a graph problem, right? Like, if you should at least like when you see this, you should at least see that this is probably a graph problem because it's fundamentally about connectivity, right? It's about what regions of space are contiguous when they're connected. Like that's about as clear as it gets that this is going to be a graph problem. But what should our what should our entity type be? What do you think? What should we model? It should be something that you know, we can say is in a particular region. Where that's something that's only going to be in one region. What do you think? Any ideas? It's just well, how about half of it? How about like let's call let's call uh, you know let's talk about the left half and the right half. And of course, you know, in different in different uh, squares, the left and the right half may refer to different things like this. But that's okay. I'll just refer. I'll always refer to, you know, the, whatever whatever piece is like. You know, think of like some area around this corner. Uh, I'll refer that to that as the left piece. Like whether it's like this or like that. Uh, well, you, you, you see what I mean. So basically, if I have a cell that looks like like this, I will call this the left, and I will call this the right. If I have a cell that looks like this, I will call this the left, and I will call this the right. So, uh, you know, which exactly, it's, that geometry will vary, but I'll always call, you know, I'll always split it into two pieces according to the input, and call one the left and call one the right. And it is definitely true that everything in this region, well, like, you know, if, if the input here was, was of this kind, it'll definitely be true that everything in this region is inside one component, and everything in this region is inside you know, another component, possibly the same one in some cases, but often different ones. Like, for example, uh, what, I, what I mean is, like, it is possible for two different sides to be in the same component if they connect in, like, some weird way, right? Like, it could be that, like, okay, so this, you know, has a wall here, but it could be that even though there's a wall here, they connect kind of behind the scenes here, right? So, they, they, I have to consider the possibility that the two halves could be in the same component, uh, but they're not automatically in the same component, they could well be in different Okay, so now I'm ready to kind of try to model this as a graph. So let me try. Uh, so what I can do is, uh, let me pull it in, let me restore this. FF. GT, right, I think that's what I had. Oh, it was the now one? No, F. Bottom is F. Oh, F. Okay, they're like this, right? Okay. Okay. So this is the input. 
so, yeah, here, here's kind of my idea for, for the graph. Like, I'm going to model every uh, piece as two vertices. So here's, like, left side and right side. So this is basically, like, 0, 0, L, and this is 0, 0, R. Think of it that way, right? Yeah. And so this is the first row, because it basically every cell gets split into two, so I'm going to model every cell with two vertices. So, you know, here's the four pixels at the top row. Here, here they are. Now, now, what's the connectivity just within this row? So, like, this is not yet, you know, considering, like, additional rows, but just within this row, it's actually always the case that, the, that you know, like, this is a left, this is a right, this is a left, this is a right, left, right, left, right. Now it's connected to left. Why? Because, you know, consider, consider two cells, right? So here's two cells. Even if they're like this, you know, hey, they're connected here. You know? Uh, like, here's the two cells, they're connected here. Uh, even if this one were like that, you know, again, they're connected here. So the left side, the right side of this one is always connected to the left side of this one. And alterna alternately, the left side and the right side is never connected to each other, right? Like, they could end up being in the same connected component if they're connected indirectly, right? If, like, this goes somewhere around there and around that, then that could happen. Like, L and R could still end up being in the same connected component, but L and R are never adjacent. They never have, they never have a direct edge, because they're always walled off here. Whether, whether the wall is shaped like this or like this, L and R will always be, the left and the right side will always be walled off and won't have a direct connection between them. But the, but the right side of one and the left side of the, of the pixel that follows always is connected, regardless of what the angle is. So basically, the, this first row structure is not dependent upon the input at all. We're not even using the input yet to build this. So the first row will always like have this structure. Uh, there's like I have not yet even used the input. And in fact, you, we see that this argument applies for the second row too. And for every row, actually. So first, we'll start just by putting this down for each of the rows. And you know, again. And so, so far, this is not even dependent on the input. This is just kind of a natural structure of the problem. But now, uh, you know, where, where is the input going to play a role? It's going to play a role in how these rows are connected. Because now, let's think about what happens when uh, we have values here, right? So let's say we have two pixels stacked on top of each other, right? So essentially there's four cases, right? You can have true, true, you can have true, false, false, true, and false, false, right? Uh, but like what happens if it's true, true? If it's true, true, then this is left R, and this is L R. And so the true true case corresponds to connecting a right pixel to a left pixel in the next row. So for uh, so this is not a true true case, but here is a true true. Uh, so uh, you've got to find the right set of pixels here. So this is you know this is the L and R of the third pixel. Uh, so here you know because this is true true, we would introduce uh, this kind of edge. Uh, like, like you, see, you see why according to this diagram. Like we're just going to consider each of the four cases. Like there's, you can have, you can have a, a true pixel on top of a false pixel. You know, you can have true, 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 false, false, true, and false, false. So this is the true, true case, right? Uh, then you can have, you can have the uh, next case, which is the uh, true, false case. So what happens in the true-false case? Well, uh, true looks like this, and false looks like this, right? So, you know, so here we see that uh, we have left, right, left, right. So here, actually, right would be connected to right if you had if you had a false on top of a true. So here, you actually get this structure, this like right. Here, you get this right connected to this right. So now we see that these all are all becoming connected, right? We see that, we, we see that this implies that like, all of these are becoming part of one. And then, uh, okay, so you, you know, then you can have uh, all 
that's true and false and false. Right? And you know, here you know, we'll show another diagram, and here we'll show another diagram. Like, okay, if you have uh, if you have false true, then you're getting you're getting this. And if you have false false, you're getting this. And after labeling it left, right, left, right, we see that in the false true case, you're connecting left to left. And in the and in the false false case, you're connecting left to right. So, you know, basically the true true corresponds to this kind of edge. This one corresponds to this kind of edge, right connected to right. This one corresponds to left connected to left. And this one corresponds to left connected to right. So basically what we'll do is, well, first we'll build this structure, the, the space structure. And then, you know, we'll just look at every pair of pixels in each column. And we'll add these additional edges. And then in the end, that, that, like that, the graph that you get will be, will, you know, cover the full connectivity of the graph. We'll represent the full connectivity of the graph. And then you just find connected components. Uh, one thing I should mention is like a practical tip when implementing these kind of problems. And you'll, you know, you'll get a lot more. This is why I say it's like really important to try the homework assignments because it sounds kind of very abstract until you do. Uh, when you, in practice, when you implement the BFS here, you don't have to like explicitly build the graph. What you can do instead is you can just uh, you can just kind of determine the connectivity as you go. What I mean by that is basically instead of building this graph up front, you can just compute whether a particular you can just run the standard connected components and you can compute whether an edge exists whenever you need it. So like so so like if, if I'm running my connected components algorithm and I would be about to retrieve the adjacency list of this vertex, I will then you know go and do the computation to see if, you know, to, to determine whether I have edges to, you know, these different things I could have edges to, right? So, like, in this case, uh, in this case, you know, every, every pixel could, could potentially be adjacent to each of its four neighbors. So, uh, well, every, every vertex could potentially be adjacent to each of its four neighbors. So I could just kind of compute them on demand from the input. I don't, I don't have to build like an explicit graph, you know, initialize all this extra memory. I can just operate directly on the grid. And I can just, uh, like, I can, I, I can just run the algorithm. You know, I can use, you know, some format to represent the vertices. Like, like maybe I'll use a three tuple of integer, integer, and boolean, like, you know, to represent like something like zero zero left, and I will use that as my like vertex representation in the BFS. And when I need to know like if zero zero, like what edges the zero zero left have, I will consider, you know, I, I will basically consider consider whether or not I am connected to zero zero right. You know, that's a potential thing I could be connected to. I could also be connected to, you know. Uh, well, I'll have to consider each of the possible directions, right? There's like eight directions I could be connected to. But I could, what I'm saying is I don't have to build the graph explicitly. I can, I can evaluate whether every edge exists as I reach that edge. And it won't be that expensive because it's only like a local test, right? Uh, to determine whether an edge exists, it's mostly just doing some check about like, you know, is the pixel above me a certain value? But, you know, if that, if that gets to... Like, like, if you can't see how to do this, you can always build a graph explicitly and then just run a standard connected components on it. So in the end, you know, I didn't draw all the edges here, but in the end, we populate this with edges and we just run a connected component so we can find out how many regions there are. And likewise, we can even determine, you know, based on if we got the like labeling of each vertex, we could find out whether each half is in which region. And whether, you know, like if I had a question about like, is this pixel in the same region as this pixel, I can answer that by just seeing if they're the same component or not. They have the same component number or not. OK, any uh, questions about this problem? Yep? I have a question. You said that we don't need to build a graph on front, right? Yep. So when we run the VFX, uh, and we try to traverse the graph of that vertex, uh, won't it need to know the other connected things or all the other 
Well, yes, it will. But what I mean is, you can compute those dynamically instead of ahead of time. So, like, instead of instead of basically initializing new objects for this graph and like, you know, building an explicit representation of this graph, what I call what I call explicit is if you ended up having like, you know, like a, a, a real like adjacency map. So, like, you know, you would end up have like like in a real adjacency map, you would have some information like this, like this one is zero zero right. And in a real adjacency map, you would build a representation like this, saying that this goes to one zero left, and and uh, you know what is this one? This is uh, zero one right. Yeah, this is well. Yeah, these these are like the same pixel, right? So ah, uh, well, or you know, you could remap the coordinates. I have twice as many here, like allow the next value that's twice as great. You know, whatever's convenient for you here, but uh, yeah. So, like in the JSON, a real like graph representation would have like this kind of information, and you would build this for every pixel. You would actually build up all these lists, and then you would solve the problem, right? But what I'm saying is that this is not really necessary. If just like whenever you need the edges for a vertex, you can generate them dynamically. It might save you some space. And how would you generate those dynamically? Well, we have to know the rules for whether something's connected, right? So, so basically, I know that if I am this pixel. You know whether or not I'm connected to this. Like I, I can know a rule like if I'm the right pixel, I'm always connected to my next left pixel, assuming it exists, right? So that's one rule. Uh, and then like all of these rules that I mentioned here, you can evaluate them like when you need to know if the edge exists or not, rather than upfront when constructing the graph. Conceptually, it's easier to understand it as like let's just construct the graph, and then let's just solve using the generic mechanism, right? But what I'm saying is you can make an optimization. You don't have to construct the graph explicitly up front if you can just evaluate the edges as you get to them, like and see whether whether they exist or not. Uh, you know, you really kind of get a better grasp of the, like particular optimizations like this when you try some of the problems. So some of the homework problems, yeah. Uh, any uh, more questions about this problem? How I compute one. Um, okay, so are you are, are you asking me to kind of show a complete like small example, or yeah. are you asking like how would you compute the edges for a particular a particular vertex? Uh, not the edges, how do you calculate that? Is the one that you need to the vertex? Uh, well, it, it's just going to be the same co connected components algorithm as before. Like once you've built a graph, right? It's just the same connected components algorithm. Like like uh, earlier, I gave kind of like a generic, uh, like a pretty generic connected components algorithm, right? So you just apply the same kind of thing to this new graph. So uh, you know, I uh, like you should be able to write a connected components routine that's like independent of uh, what the domain is that just works for any graph, right? And then you know you would just apply it to what like if you build the graph explicitly, you would just apply it right then and there. I, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, yeah, I'm not sure like how do you compute like how many pages are there total uh set or like whatever you can put Okay, well uh, did you understand like the previous uh, problem that we did? Well, I mean then the answer is in the same way, right? Like like basically once you've abstracted the problem into a graph, it's independent of the domain, right? It, like it, like that's the whole point of graphs, right? To give the same solution for unrelated problems, right? So uh, once you've converted it into this representation, and you, all you have is just like, hey, I have a generic graph, compute the number of connected components, then the same algorithm from before applies. Actually, if you uh, if you draw all the lines on that thing, yes, it's very easy for me to see that the eight regions. That might help everybody if you actually draw all the lines. Okay. Um, it takes a couple minutes. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I I didn't want to do it on this big example, but but, but okay. Uh, let's. Like like okay, let's let's just do it with a smaller example. I can do it right now. I mean here you can take a look at it so you don't have to figure it out. And then if I just look at if you just look at it, you can see immediately that it's eight regions and people can get intuition for it. Uh okay, fine. Well since you like since you've done the work, uh unfortunately I've now been very slow. Uh okay. Well the rest of the Huh? Once he draws it out, we'll see immediately that it's. Yeah, like, well, 
like, like, okay, so, so what he's suggesting is, like, sure, if I didn't uh, stop short in my example, if I actually drew all the lines, eventually, uh, so for example, in his, uh, if he did this correctly, he gets, let's see, he gets, uh, yeah, I mean, 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 yeah, yeah. It's immediately obvious that there's eight different. Yeah, yeah. So, so after you draw out all the lines, like, like at least if you did this correctly, after you draw out all the lines, you get some representation like that, and then you know you could tell that there's eight regions just by saying like, okay, one, two. You know, this is this is some region two. Uh, like we can, you know, I, I can sort of highlight it for you. So, so you get, you know, you got some region one here, then you got this region, uh, region two, and then you got some region three, some uh, region four, region, oh, region five. And then this one's by itself, six. And then you got seven and eight. Yeah, so that, that, that like that's how you can visually see that they're the same regions, like whatever's connected in the end, right? But uh, I think like 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 I think you if you need to see this, it might be kind of like missing the point in some sense, because the point of graphs is that you convert problems to a common representation that can essentially be solved by the same mechanism. So uh, if you understood the previous solution about how, like, in the other problem we took, uh, we basically produced a graph and we counted how many connected components it has, it should be the same for this problem. Like, once you build the graph, it's the same subproblem, and then we can solve in the same way of how many connected components does it have. Yep? So the original problems count how many uh, connected components are? Is that the original problem? Well, there was one problem where we said, okay, what are what is in the connected component of the pixel we clicked on? Uh, I mean, this problem. Uh, yes, I mean, yes. So here, here the problem statement is you know just output how many connected regions of space there are. But of course, you could imagine extensions where you uh, you ask, okay, how many? Uh, get, or, or you can you can ask like which parts you know can you can you show which parts of the input are in which component? And you should be able to do this off this representation as well. Like, you know, you know that this part of the input is in component one, you know that this one is in component two, and so on. Uh, would it be bad if, uh, just to give you sale and divide it into four sections? Yeah, we need four nodes for each cell. Okay, yeah, so, 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 so now you're saying, like, what, why, why did we divide it into two and not into four? Well, okay, so four is not really necessary, if, I mean, for one, right? But, let's see, does it work for, like, how would you divide it into four sections? Like, like, I guess, like so. Right? Yeah, two diagonals. Yeah, two diagonals. You know, why didn't we divide the problem up this way? Um, well, I guess there's no, no, no immediate problem with it. Like, we could, uh, we could. I mean, it makes more notes. I mean, I guess it's kind of unnecessary, but, like, you could. Uh, I, I mean, I don't see why not. Uh, and, then, and then, basically, you know, you have to, if, if, every, if every pixel has, like, you know, if every uh, pixel has these four pieces, like A, B, C, D, then based on whether it's a forward slash or a backward slash, you know, you have to determine that either A and B are connected and C and D are connected, or it's the other way around, B and C are connected and A and D are connected. So then, yet yeah, even within a row, how they're connected will vary a little bit depending on uh, the input. Yeah. Uh, you, you could. Yeah, I mean, it's viable, but it's just not necessary. Uh, if you modify it so that every like every pixel could have a forward slash, a backward slash, or both, right? If that was the problem variant, that's a variation, right? Like maybe maybe every pixel could have a forward slash, backward slash, neither or both. You know, if you did something like that, then maybe it would make sense to have. Well, in fact, you would have to go there. You would in that in that case, you would have to have four different. Uh, you'd have to split each pixel into four like this. Because then, yeah, actually, each piece could be in a different component. Yeah. Uh, okay. 
Are we ready to uh, move on to the next problem? Let's see. Uh, I have a question. Yep. I'm still confused on the So you could still use the yeah. because your uh, your uh, your uh, yeah, well, for all connected component problems, you can use the DFS, depth per search. Which is an actual uh, Either one. Like, there's really, uh, you can go DFS or you can go BFS. Uh, so in this graph series, we have actually not covered depth per search yet. We have only done breadth per search, so that's why I'm proposing you do this using breadth per search. But depth per search is fine. You can, I mean, in terms of complexity or anything? It's equal. Uh, BFS and DFS both have V plus E runtime complexity. Uh, I tend to think that, I mean, I tend to like implementing BFS a little bit better. Uh, you know, I don't want to discuss the pros and cons just because, like, in this session we have not yet, like, in this unit of graphs we have not yet covered depth for search. Uh, I want to save any discussions of trade-offs and such until such time that we do cover it. But, yeah, I just want people to remember, like, you know, what, we'll see later that depth for search is another algorithm for establishing connectivity, and you can certainly use either breadth first or depth first search here. Because they're not computing anything specifically. Yeah, like, yeah, it's why? exactly. Exactly. Depth for search will not compute shortest paths, and if you actually need the shortest path, then you have to do BFS. But because you don't here, it's not required. I just wanted to address a couple points. So one of the questions that I got was, uh, you know, why uh, why do we say that the time complexity of BFS is order of d plus e, right? Uh, so why not just this, right? Like, isn't this the same? Like, why not just say it's order of e? And actually, uh, the, you know, the answer is for most intensive purposes, like, it would be totally fine to say that. Uh, so usually the number of edges in a graph is bigger than the number of vertices. Why? Because most graphs, like, don't have that many disconnected vertices. So typically we expect, uh, like, there's basically two, two main kinds of, uh, two kind of extremes that we have for graphs, right? One is what we might call a sparse graph. So in a sparse graph, like, there's not going to be a lot of lone vertices, but most vertices only have, like, a couple outbound edges, right? So in a sparse graph, it might be something like a social network where, okay, N is, you know, N is, uh, you know, there's two billion people or something, but there's, but each person is only connected to a couple other people, right? So in a sparse graph, the number of ver edges, you know, is basically some <laughs> constant multiplied by the number of vertices, right? This is in, like, a sparse graph. In like a social network, you might expect that the number of edges is like maybe some large constant, like I don't know, 200, 500, whatever it is, multiplied by the number of people, number which are represented by vertices. Uh, and then you can have like a dense graph, which is like some kind of situation where everything is related to everything else or most other things. So in a dense graph, it would be like okay, maybe every vertex is connected to like most of the other vertices or a big part of the other vertices. So here, you know, like in this one, generally we expect c greater than one, and so this is like a sparse graph. And in a dense graph, we generally expect we generally expect a number of edges. We expect every vertex will be connected to like most other vertices. So essentially, some constant less than one, you know, times b. So, so this is basically, or in, a, in a sparse graph, this is order, you know, E is basically the same as order B, and in this one, uh, E is order B squared, essentially. Uh, and so, yeah, given that, given that, that, if that's the case, if you, even if you have a sparse graph, so, so, you know, like, think about what happens to this term. Like, this term is either, like, B, or it's B squared, or it's something in between. It's probably not smaller than B. So usually it's pretty safe to think about the runtime of the algorithm as just being order e. Now why do we write it as b plus e? Because in theory, uh, you can have a graph that, you know, is completely disconnected, right? You could have a graph where it's just like, this is your whole graph, right? <clears throat> and you wouldn't know that there's no edges in this graph until you, like, actually visit the vertex. So if you want to, like, run, like, a connected component or something like that, you will have to visit every vertex, like, in the adjacency list just to check that its adjacency list is empty. And that's where you get the B term. So most of the time it's not really necessary. Most of the time you can think of it just, just being order E if you want to simplify it a little. And you can just kind of say, like, for most, for anything but the sparsest of graphs, this is true. 
But like formally, there's a reason why you could write that, and it's just to, you know, uh, just in case the graph looks like that. Because in theory, like you do have to visit every vertex just to check whether it's adjacent to less than that two or not. Okay. So uh, yeah, I mean, I, I thought that was like a like a good question, you know, because it does seem like intuitively this is the case that you know order v plus e should just be reducible to order e, and it pretty much is for most practical circumstances. But technically, it's not technically always the case, which is why you know it's written that way. Uh, okay, another question I got asked, and this one's kind of a little little more in depth, so maybe we can spend five minutes on it because it, uh, because it is like a common question, and hopefully it should be like fairly obvious how to do this if you've been following BFS uh, so far, but it's worth going over, which is like the classic question of like, how do you clone a graph? So this is like a classic, classic question. Uh, so clone a graph, like what does it mean? It basically means that, let's say I give you a graph like this. Uh, it may be like a directed graph, for example, or, or undirected. It may be weighted or unweighted, whichever one it is, right? So let's say I give you a graph like this, and basically what I'm expecting is that you will produce, uh, like imagine these nodes have some kind of like, you know, I identity, like there's, you know, these nodes have like node objects, and each node object has a list of, you know, it's, it's adjacency list that refers to other node objects. And so what you want to do is you want to produce like a new graph that is just like a clone, you know, has new nodes, you know, newly allocated nodes, but its structure will ultimately be exactly the same. So it has to preserve all the same structure, but it has to be like newly allocated nodes. So this is essentially the concept of cloning the graph. So how do you clone a graph? Well, you can do it using essentially the same kind of approach as connected components. Uh, so uh, basically the idea is I will, well, let's, let's just do the like undirected case. Uh, like, yeah, so, so okay, so the directed case may be a little more complicated, but for example, if you consider the undirected case, <coughs> well, really, I mean, uh, okay, okay, so there's different variations of this problem. There's, there's the variation where you're only given like a pointer to one of the nodes. Uh, so, you know, that variation is the one that's most related to uh, BFS, because basically, um, let's say you're given the variation where uh, you're, instead of being given the graph explicitly, uh, you're just given a pointer to the source node, right? And basically the source node will have a list that points you to B and C, and these in turn will have lists that point you to this node, and so on. So if you have that, uh, like first you might need to do a BFS to actually get the adjacency list representation. But once you get the adjacency list representation of the graph, it's actually pretty straightforward to clone it. Like you don't really have to do much more traversal. Any traversal that you need to do would just be to get the adjacency list of the graph. But once you have the adjacency list of the graph, what do you do? Well, let's see. So let's say you have an adjacency list like this, uh, B and C. And let's say you have, uh, you know, so for B, the adjacency list is A, C, D. Um, okay, and then, you know, for D, you have like B and C. Uh, yeah, so you, you got this adjacency list for this graph. Uh, and the idea would just be uh, like, okay, like iterate through these in an arbitrary order and maintain a hash map that basically the first time you see a reference to a node, you, uh, like, like the first time you see a reference to a particular node, you create the node and, you know, you, you, you create the structure in the corresponding graph. So like, uh, let's say, uh, when you're first traversing this, like you're, you, you don't have any nodes that are cloned yet. So right now, like, like you know, here's your, here's your map and your map starts out empty. Uh, so, and your cloned graph starts out empty. Here's the cloned graph. Uh, and the, so, so, so what happens here, you see this A, and you're like, okay, this one's not in my map. So then you allocate the new node, and you establish this mapping. Let's say the new node, like, we'll refer to it as E, or whatever. Uh, okay, so now, so now you've, you've created it, and that means you, you know, put it in your 
clone graph. Well, you know, you put it in your clone graph, and then you, you know, create this list for it. And then you don't say, okay, it's B in my map. Well, no, it's not. So, you know, I create another node for it, and I record the association. What's the point of recording the association? It's so that if I encounter B in another list, I link it back to the correct node, right? Uh, and, and, you know, now I just do this, and then, like, the association of C to G will also get recorded, and we'll go here. And now, and now, when we go back to B, aha, uh -huh, I will say, oh, okay, I already have an association for this, and I will label this as F instead of creating a new node, right? Because creating a new node would not be correct here. Because then, you know, B would not have a consistent, you know, the reference from A to B would not be the same as this reference from A to A. And then, you know, here I would look up A, and I would find it, and basically it's just a, this kind of rewriting. And then here, you know, when I go to reference D, I would see it's not in my map, and I will add another node, and then put it in. And then for the rest of these, these are just going to be looked up from the map, and the graph is going to be cloned in this way. And why is this a BFS problem at all? Well, it's only a BFS problem if, you know, you're not given this list up front then you have to do a PFS from your starting node to recover the adjacency list, and then you can solve it this way. And it's easy to see how you, how you do a PFS to recover the adjacency list. It's the same as the connected components algorithm, right? It's just about visiting all of the vertices. You just go through and visit all the vertices, and you have a list of all vertices, and from those vertices, you, you can get their adjacencies. Okay. Uh, you know, I thought it was like a worthwhile question to know how to do, but it's actually a pretty simple Pretty simple question, right? Because again, it's just about visiting every node so you know the adjacency list, and then you just use some like simple hashing map, you know, like a like a hash map or something, or some you know like any kind of map to provide these associations. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, any yeah yeah any, any questions on this before we like go on to the next problem? All right. Ah, uh, next problem it is. <coughs> okay, so here's the next problem. So you're given some graph. Um, okay, so yeah, let me. This one to illustrate some of the points, it actually needs to be like a not really super tiny example. Okay, so you're given some graph. Um, Also unweighted, you could also ask this problem for a weighted graph, but I'm just going to make it unweighted for now. 
And, you know, if I, if I give you like a source and a destination, if I told you like, okay, you know, here's the source, here's the destination, like you could find the shortest path here. Okay. So that's that. Uh, but instead, I'm going to give you a source one and a destination one, and also a source two and a destination two. And basically, what I want to do is the problem is posed like this: delete the maximum number of nodes for delete the maximum number of edges from the graph, such that uh, these this source is still connected to this destination, and this. Uh, source is still connected to this destination. So, for example, uh, here I provide you with uh, this uh, S1 here, and this D, D1 here, and this S2 here, and this D2 here. So, I want to, do, uh, I want to delete as many edges from the graph as I can, such that S1 is still connected to D1, and S2 is connected to D2. Now, uh, let's think about this for a second. <coughs> what, what, what does delete maximum number of nodes mean? I mean maximum number of edges. Well, uh, there's actually a really straightforward reformulation of this to show this path. So I just presented it this way because the original presentation of this problem I saw said delete maximum number of edges, and I, will, and, you know, I just wanted to show this step to you so if you ever encounter this, you won't be confused by it. Uh, what happens if you delete as many edges as you can? That's the same as asking, uh, let's keep as few edges as we can, right? Like, asking to delete as many edges as possible is the same as asking, what is the minimum number of edges we need to preserve in order to... Uh, well, you know, where the problems are very related. If I know how many edges I... If I know the minimum that I need to preserve, the total number of edges minus that number is the maximum number I can delete. Uh, so, what does this mean? So, okay, so let's say I removed S2 and D2 from the requirements, and I just asked you, what is the minimum number of edges I need to preserve in order for S1 and D1 to be connected? What am I really asking for here? Sure. Exactly, because the shortest path will just be the, the minimum then, right? Okay, but how about if there's two pairs? What, what, what do you think the solution is? So, okay, so idea one that people get is let's find the shortest path between S1 and D1, and the shortest path between S2 and D2. This doesn't work. Because the problem is that it, th there could be opportunities for sharing of edges in a strategic way, right? So it could be, the, like, here's the shortest path between S1 and D1. The cost of this path is 5. And there's no better way, right? This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, there's no better way. And here, likewise, four, five. Okay, so if if I were to take this guidance and I would just find these paths independently, I get a total solution of ten. I keep these edges, and I keep these edges, and I delete everything else. Right? I would get ten edges. But now I'm going to show you that I can do better. So this solution of finding the shortest path independently is wrong. Which should be unsurprising, because this doesn't take into account the possibility that the paths can share edges, right? So it's unsur completely unsurprising that this is wrong. But, uh, I mean, consider, consider this uh, idea. So basically, I, I'm choosing these nodes because even though the path is longer here, this allows a lot of opportunity for reuse. So what I've done here is like one, two, like, well, well, let's see. I've kept two edges here, two edges here, and then one, two, three, four here. So for a total of eight. So this is like better than the solution of ten, right? Here I have a solution of ten, and but if I share with this, these central nodes, I get eight. Okay, so it, it's not really surprising. Like I mean, only like like people do fall for this, but like you know, a lot of people don't don't fall for something as quite as simple as this because it's pretty obvious that. It Right? Because you're not even considering the fact that like paths may share edges. You know, some people fall something for at least a little bit more understandable, which is like, okay, let's let's find the two shortest paths and then let's at least check if they have any edges in common and if so remove them and actually count that. But of course that doesn't work because as we can see, it could be that the two shortest paths don't have any edges in common, <coughs> but there is some setup that does have edges in common that is better. 
Uh, here's another idea, and again, like there's no reason why you would expect this idea to work, other than that you're trying to, you know, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? You're trying too hard to like shoehorn this into being some kind of simple application of shortest path. Uh, other than that, there's like no reason that you would expect this to work, but let's try it. So, which is like, I'm going to find, I'm going to take S1 and D1, and I'm going to find the shortest path between S1 and D1. Uh, so here we, here we go. Like, we see already the solution's got to be wrong, because we shouldn't even be finding this path in the first place, right? But, but okay. Uh, so let's say we found this path, and now my idea is I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to treat, like, all of these edges as free. So basically, when I find the shortest path between S2 and D2, I will no longer find this path, because this path is no longer the shortest after I decide to treat all of these edges as free. Like, once I decide to treat all of these edges as free, Essentially, all of these that are on this path can be, can be seen as like condensed down to a single vertex because they're free, right? So after I've already paid for this first path, the graph basically looks like this. So here's S1, and it's also D1. It's all been, even, it's all been collapsed into a single node here. Uh, and then, you know, this still has the connection it had before. Uh, you know, you still go up into this, into this, like, you know, you still have all of these other nodes. One, two, three, four, five. And then you have this. Well, you don't have this, because this loops back into this. This, this is now what it's called lines. Right? Uh, and so what we have left here is you have something like this left here. Yeah, well, these are still left. We get these in the last. Uh, yeah, uh, and so now you might say, well, okay, these are free. Uh, you know, now essentially <coughs> we're the best path between S2 and uh, D2. And D2 is like over here. Uh, well, uh, you know, now the best path is just like one, like, you know, it's just like one, two, three, four, but it still doesn't work because like you still get a value of nine. Uh, so yeah. Um, yeah, if by chance I like miscounted here and you actually do get a value of eight, it doesn't really matter. Like you know you extend these by another one and then you find an example of that uh, for which it doesn't work. So like you can't just like find one path and assume then assume it's free and then find the second path. Because it's basically uh, it, that, it, like, there's no reason you should expect that to work. So if you're kind of like looking at this, like, why would you even try that? Well, you shouldn't. It's just like some people. Have, I, I've seen some people that have tried this problem, try that, and it doesn't work. And there's there's no reason to expect it to because uh, after all, basically in this solution, what you'd be doing is you'd be first finding the path S1 to D1, and then you'd be saying like, well, okay, you know, I found the path S1 to D1, and now. Now your finding of the path from S2 to D2 is going to be kind of constrained by a decision you already made, which isn't really the right thing to do, because the right thing to do is to kind of find your best share of those. So would it help to do just the opposite, for instead of making it free, make it the most expensive path? Well, no, because that, no, that doesn't make, that, that makes uh, less sense, actually, because if you did that, then, like, like are you saying, should we like prohibit these vertices from being selected and then select another path? No, because that would just guarantee that 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 would be the same as just guaranteeing that S1 to D1 and S2 to D2 are going to be independent paths, which is also not correct. Like we've already seen that we can't select the paths independently, right? If you make these really expensive after you find this path, well, first of all, you've already got your path in the solution. You've already got this path in the solution, which lets you know that this has got to be wrong. Uh, but then secondly, you know, you you, uh, yeah, like, like then, then, you know, if these are expensive, then there's no way that this, they're going to be used in, like, this solution. Uh, which means you're going to select the paths independently, and again, that's wrong. Uh, so, what do you do here? Well, you, like, this is like, you know, you have to have some, like, some observations that kind of, you know, give you an insight here. Because it really seems like the paths have to be optimized for together, right? They can't be, like, you can't pick one and then, and then pick the other one and then maybe remove some shared edges. It doesn't really work, right? 
you have to have kind of a, an approach that from the beginning considers choosing pairs of paths. Uh, so here's like you have to have some you have to start out with some observations. So here's an observation. Let's say we start with some S1. Right? And there's some D1 that we reach. So let's say, like, like let's just consider some properties of the optimal solution. So let's say we reached it by as a path. So we, this might not be like the shortest path, right? But we've reached, you know, D1 by a some path. There's some intermediate nodes on the way here. Uh, you know, okay, so we've reached, you know, we, we, we've taken from S1 and we've reached D1 by a some path. This is not necessarily the shortest path. Not, not like the, the shortest path that would be independently shortest if you just had, if you just had to find the path between S1 and D1. And you also have the S2 over here. And, you know, this also reaches, you know, D2 by some path. So, you know, first you have to consider the possibility that it, maybe these paths never cross, right? It, it is possible. Like, we don't, like, it, is, it could be the case that these paths never cross. So this is one, this is the insufficient by itself to solve the problem, but we will note this as a possible case. So one of the, one of the approaches that we will try is we will try to independently take these paths and see if that's a good solution. But in addition, what happens if the paths cross? So this is the more interesting case, of course. So let's say, you know, the paths are crossing now. So here I have uh, this S2, and here I have this D2. So let's say the paths cross. Like, right? So let's say, you know, maybe they cross here or something. <coughs> like, is it possible that the path will do something like this? Weave back and forth with the other path in this kind of manner. It's actually not. Uh, here, here's why not. So let's say we had any solution that considers something like this. Right? I, I will now improve the solution. This one can just follow this one, right? Up until they fork out. Like basically, basically the blue path can now be can now be this at no no cost, right? So no optimal solution can have this kind of interweaving of the paths, which greatly simplifies the structure. Right? Like the paths can never like in other words, if the paths ever meet, then the only possibility is that they stick together for a while until forking off again. And then they can never meet again, because if they ever met again, you could show that the path is not optimal, right? Because if you ever have if you ever have the path split off, like if this one splits off even for a second, right? You, you know, if you have like if they follow each other for a while, but then this one splits off and this one does something else, well why not remove one of these two, right? That preserves the connectivity. So from this it's clear that the paths would would have to like follow each other. Uh, you know, like they can basically only meet once, travel together for a while, and then fork off again, if they have to. <clears throat> All right, so, so basically, here's what this implies. Any solution can be characterized as follows now. Any solution has two points, let's call these V1 and V2. That is the portion of the shared path that they travel together. It is also possible that there is no such portion, in which case the paths are just independent, and that's also fine. Like, we'll also consider that case separately. So we'll consider one case where the paths are independent, we'll just take the two shortest paths, and we'll just, uh, you know, consider if just taking the two shortest paths independently is the best solution. And if it is, that will be the one. But alternatively, it could be that there's some vertex V1 or V2, with some edges in between, right? Like this. Uh, where the cost of this part of the path is paid only once. <coughs> and then, you know, you got, you got this portion of the path, this portion of the path, this portion of the path, and this portion of the path. Uh, one of these, like some of these forests can be empty. Like it could be that V2, V1 equals S2. So like it could be that, that like to get to S1 you just continue on the path or something. In which case, like, okay, it's, this segment is zero now. Uh, and so, and also what we can see is this, every individual component of this must be optimized independent, can be optimized independently because, 
Because let's say you know I get some solution that satisfies this description, and let's say I did not choose a shortest path between the v1 and v2. Now I can use like this sort of copy and paste argument that if there is a better path between v1 and v2, I can just go ahead and replace my solution with this with this path between v1 and v2. So you know essentially. Uh, this means that I can just optimize every piece of the solution independently. Uh, and, but, but the problem is I don't know what to choose for v1 and v2, right? Like what's, you know, what, what v1 and v2 are the best v1 and v2 to choose uh, to, you know, give myself a path as short as possible. So the simple solution is try every possibility. Uh, so the idea is like this. We're going to try every possible v1 and v2. Like every v1 not equal to v2 we're going to try. And then, for in each case, we will just contemplate something such as, uh, you know, we will say we will say, you know, path, you know, the path between, well, the path for all of these vertices, so like, you know, S1, well, you know, D1, D2, S2, or whatever. It's, uh, you know, the best path here is uh, choose. Well, choose this v1 and v2. So you know. If we've already chosen the v1 and v2, uh, the shortest path is basically the sum of five pieces, right? So you have to you have to say, okay, so you know, we'll we'll consider this v1 and we'll say, okay, so this is shortest path between s1 v1 plus shortest path between s2 v1 uh, plus shortest path between v1 and v2. That's you know this piece counts only once, right? Uh, and then shortest path between, you know, v2 and, and v1, and then shortest path between v2 and v2. Uh, this is not 100% accurate. There's like one more issue here that we'll see in a moment, but this just gives you an idea. Uh, so, you know, basically we try every possible choice of v1 and v2, and we just add up all the shortest paths in this manner, and that should give us the solution. Uh, now, one thing to consider here is, it's, it, and, and this was, uh, like this problem was like encountered in some coding contests, and this was actually a common mistake that uh, contestants make, is uh, contestants assumed that this S2 must necessarily be connected to V to V1, which is uh, not the case. Like we can say, like let V1 just be whatever vertex S1 is connected to. That is fine, but you can't actually assume that S2 was necessarily connected to V1 because you do have to consider the possibility that the other path goes in the other direction, right? So like you do have to also try. You have to you have to consider this possibility that maybe it would be better to uh, you know take this one and connect it over here. You know, take this one and connect it over here, and then take this one and connect it over here. Like in this one, of course, in this example, of course, this doesn't look correct, but, you know, uh, like imagine, okay, so it's it's easier to imagine this sort of scenario if you just, you know, position those differently. Uh, so let's say, like without loss of generality, we can just define V1 to be like whatever. S, S1 is connected to, and then D1 has to be whatever V2 is connected to. But you can, you have to actually try both directions in terms of, like, let's say this is uh, D1, or let's say this is uh, S2, and let's say this is D2, right? Uh, like, it could be that the best way to connect these up is like this, and then this goes like that, or it could or it could be that the best way to connect these up is this, you know, alternative way of connecting them like that, uh, and then connecting uh, this point here. Uh, you have to try both possibilities. So that's why I say this is only one of the formulas. You have to try this way, and you have to try the other way, because either one of those could be the better solution. Uh, so, so yeah. So, so basically. Uh, you know, basically what you do is for every v v one not equal to v two, you 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 know you run this formula, which is just taking five shortest paths and adding them up, and then you try you know the other connection direction, uh, and again you know uh, you evaluate this formula with like some terms in here flipped. 
Uh, and so that's going to, you know, so it, the, this, now this seems to have like really high complexity, so let's see if we can optimize it, right? So first of all, what's the naive time complexity here? So the naive time complexity is every time we require shortest paths, we will compute the shortest paths on the fly in the graph, right? Kind of bad, because uh, as you see, like there's just five shortest paths expressions in here already, and you know I need five more to try the other uh, direction of connectivity. So you've got a total of ten, but this has got to be tried for every v1 and v2. So essentially, what's the time complexity? Well, for every v1 and v2 pair, so that's v squared and different combinations, right? I have to try, like you know, there's I have to try v vertices for v1, then anything that is not equal to v1 can be the other vertex. So v minus one. And then multiply by, uh, now I have to try the you know, five different combinations here. Uh, and this goes up to 10. And then how much time does it take to try, uh, how much time does it take to try a shortest path? Well, that's order of v plus e, right? So in the end, I see, okay, we're going to allow this simplification. Just, you know, uh, I'm not considering the case of like super sparse graphs, I'm just going to call it order e. And so, uh, in big O notation, this is e squared e. Uh, you know, because for every pair of vertices, we have to run an order e time algorithm, or 10, 10 of those, actually. Uh, okay, so we can, we can improve this like pretty significantly. We're going to be able to improve this to just v e. It's not going to be v plus e, it's still going to be v times e, but we can improve it at least that much. And the, the answer is pre-compute. Right? So wouldn't it be convenient if before we ever start evaluating this for loop, that is going to be like 4v1, 4v2, evaluate this expression and see if it's better than the best one already, wouldn't it be better if we just already had pre-computed every shortest path between v1 and v2? So what I'm proposing is, uh, before we begin, you know, kind of this loop where we try this for every v1 and v2, let us do this step where we, um, where what we do is we pre-compute basically like a matrix essentially, where you know you've got like v1, v2, v3, v4, da 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 over here, and you've got v1, v2, v3, da da da. So this is like a shortest path matrix, uh, and you know it's got zeros along the main diagonal here because the distance of a vertex to itself is zero. Right? And here, like here, for example, you would have the shortest path between V2 and V1. So if we pre-computed this matrix, then each one of these expressions is just a constant time or true lookup in this matrix. So actually, uh, like once we, so we have to try this for every combination of V1 and V2. We have to try this formula. So, uh, but this is just five constant time axes or ten time constant time axes or whatever. Uh, if we already have this matrix. <coughs> so this, basically this formula gets evaluated in constant time once we have the matrix. Uh, but we have to do it for every v1 and v2. So then this part just becomes order v squared. But no e this time, just order v squared. Now of course we also have to count the time it takes to calculate this matrix, right? Which is, how do we calculate the matrix? Well, uh, remember that shortest paths it doesn't have to take a source and a destination, right? VFS can just start with a source and go, and it costs order E time to find the shortest path to all destinations. So how about this? For each source vertex, we will begin a shortest path out to all destinations. So this will take E time. This will take order E time per vertex, and this is done on V vertices, because for every, we try every source vertex. So basically, every time, for every source vertex, we'll be able to populate one row. At the end of our shortest path algorithm, for, like we'll start the VFS with V1. At the end of our shortest path algorithm, we'll be able to populate this row. That's the idea. And at the end of our, then we'll run it again for V2, and we'll populate this row. Uh, so, and this will take order V plus E, you know, order E time, times V vertices, and this will take order V E. So our total complexity, is we have this order VE computation step to get all pairs of shortest paths, you know, uh, shortest paths to every pair of vertices. And then we'll add in this term of evaluating this formula, V squared. And, you know, uh, with the assumption that V is smaller than E, uh, this is just the E term dominates, and this is just VE. 